and I'm the Adult Services Supervisor at MacArthur Library here in Biddeford. And I am very delighted that you could join us and spend an hour with us um, talking about mushrooms. And for anybody that might be having any kind of technical difficulties, I have put my email in the chat room and I have also put our technology experts. Joe Sanderson is sort of behind the scenes so he can give you a hand if you have any difficulties and the telephone number of the library. If you have any problems with the video or sound, you can give us a call at the library and Joe can walk you through things behind the scenes. Um, we will be recording the talk and putting it on our YouTube channel in a couple of days after we just edit the film. So if you're not comfortable being in the video, make sure that you um, hide your screen so that you're not you're not seen in the video. Um, during this time, a couple of housekeeping details, please stay muted during the talk so that we can really focus on Greg's talk about mushrooms. Um, but if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat room. And Greg will probably be monitoring that at the same time. He has this great way of doing it with two monitors. So if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. 
At the end of the session, if time permits, we may have an opportunity to unmute you and allow you to ask questions directly to Greg. Um, we also, I just wanted to remind you that we have a second session about mushrooms called mm -hmm. Integrating Medicinal Mushrooms into Your Life a month from today. So on March 3rd at 6.30, exactly uh, four weeks from today, we'll be doing a second session with Greg about uh, medicinal mushrooms. Um, but it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Deuce author Greg Marley, who has been collecting, studying, eating, growing, and teaching about mushrooms for 45 year, for over 45 years. He has spread his love of mushrooms to hundreds through walks, talks, classes across New England over the past 30 years. And he's the author of these two delightful books. Oh, let me unblur for a minute. Um, I have to tell you that as a librarian, I'm, I'm really, really impressed by these books. They're well written, well presented, and just a, a magnificent wealth of information about mushrooms and really anecdotal too. So I really kind of love the stories. Um, so the first one is Chanterelle Dreams and Amani Amanita Nightmares, The Love, Lore, and Mystique of Mushrooms. And the second, second one is Mushrooms for Health. Medicinal Secrets of Northeastern fun, fun, Fungi. We've been joking all afternoon about Greg Marley being a fun guy, so he's probably heard that <laughs> over and over. But we were really excited about this program. Um, as a volunteer mushroom identi identification consultant to the poison, poison centers, he provides expertise in mushroom poisoning cases. When not mushrooming, Greg works as a mental health clinician and behavioral health consult consultant specializing in suicide prevention and, and suicide grief. Um, so without any further ado, thank you so much, Greg, for being with us this evening and sharing your knowledge and love of the mushrooming world. Thank you, Melanie, and, and definitely thank Joe for the behind the scenes um, expertise that we rely on to make the Zoom Zoom. Um, so I'm really happy to be here sitting in my loft at home and presenting to uh, through the MacArthur Library to people zooming in from wherever you happen to be coming in, which is one of the wonders of virtual work. Um, it makes it so easy to access um, this, particularly during a time when it's not as safe for many people to join together. Um, so I'm going to underscore what Melanie said is while we're doing this, while we're talking, while I'm presenting, please feel free to use the chat. Add questions you have, and I'm going to kind of, I've got it up on my right hand uh, upper monitor. I'll kind of wander through that occasionally. Um, I'm not going to, I may answer some of them while I'm talking, but only if it doesn't take me down another pathway from, from what I'm focusing on. Um, so respect that, and we'll try and get to them at the end. Um, Melanie, I'm going to, I have got a, a pretty full uh, presentation. Uh, Melanie says that we'll keep it open as long as people keep asking questions. I'm not sure how long she's willing to push that, um, but we, we're, we're comfortable staying past the magic 730 hour. Um, so with that, I'm going to get my face off the spotlight here and go ahead and share my screen and share this presentation. I want to say a couple of things as I pull this together. Um, one is that um, I will be showing primarily uh, mushrooms that grow in Maine. Most of the photographs were taken in Maine, um, a few of them in, in, in broader parts of New England. So this is gonna be a focus on our mushrooms. Um, and, and I think all of the photographs in here are mine with the exception of ones that I, I'll mention to you. So we're calling this fo Foraging for Edible Mushrooms embracing the foolproof few. And I will define that as we move on. And I'm gonna start and I'm gonna end with some poetry by Rumi. And I love this, I found it earlier. It says, feel yourself being quietly drawn by the deeper pull of what you truly love. And for me, that's been mushrooms for a long time. I bought my first mushroom book um, when I was 18 and I've never stopped. So let's move on. Um, another kind of poem, and this, this, this is a poet from um, Thailand 
and the forest makes your heart gentle. You become one with it. No place for greed or anger there. And since I started going out into nature, and for me, it started in New Mexico, going out into the mesas, in the deserts, in the mountains there, um, it's been a place of solace, a place where I could escape into nature, into quietness, um, and into um, peace. Um, and so we're going to move into there. For me, mushrooms remain a place and a lens with, with which to enter nature and to view nature. I've been in conversation with some, there's a, a group of professors at Bates College who are doing a project. They're going to pull together a resource database of people's use of their motion of their eyes, how they view the world. And they have invited me to take part and, and to, to track how I use my, my, my vision as I'm scanning for mushrooms. And I'm gonna have fun doing that with them as we move along. So on we go. Um, so there's a few people that are still not muted. So please be aware. Um, to, to mute yourself as you move along. And if not, I believe that probably Joe or, or, or um, um, <clears throat> Melanie will do that. So just before we dive into the foolproof four, I just want to quickly move through a range, of images, um, a range of images about mushrooms and what they look like in the world. And for me, you know, you hear the story. Well, it's kind of mushroom colored which often means some kind of phase of brown. And for me, mushrooms are a kaleidoscope of colors, all colors of the rainbow, all shapes. And so we hear a false chanterelle and the dog stinkhorn mutinous, um, which I collected these ones or found these photographed them up in Washington County a few years ago. And morels in the spring, we're gonna cover a, a range of seasons here. The beauty, you know, going into a darkened forest that's rain wet and shaded and coming upon a, a varnish conch. And that shiny varnished um, is just pulls right out on a rainy day. We'll talk about those next week. These is a photograph from my garden. I grow the wine caps tropharia. And I got to tell you, when I saw these mushrooms, and, and this was an arc of these gorgeous orange hidden elms growing um, under spruce and fir on moss in Washington County. And there were probably 15 feet of an arc. And it just, it, to my mind, it looks like a mixture of dream sickle and orange fluff. It's just beautiful, not edible. And the proper name, I call this the bloody court, is Cortinarius semi-sanguineus. So it's semi, somewhat, sanguineous, bloody. So it's the somewhat bloody Cortinarius. Um, beautiful mushroom. I saw more of these in 2021 than I probably have seen in any two or three years combined. And these little, I combined the photograph of the little orange cup, orange peel cup with the uh, red eft, which is a, uh, a type of salamander. Golden spindles. And this one, you might think that I played with this photograph to bring the colors up, but this electric blue is the true interior color of the latex, the, the milk that is exuded by the indigo milk cap. And this is an edible mushroom. Some parts of Maine, I've never found it in plentiful numbers, but enough a few times to collect and cook. And if you're ever interested in following Dr. Zeus and the green eggs and ham, these mushrooms, when you cook them, they turn green. So fun. So people start to worry. When we move beyond the beauty, the wonder, the mystery of mushrooms, and start to slide into the decisions around making food. And then we start to worry, we start to pull into the kind of memory and language and learning of our childhoods. And so I'm going to ask you, what's a mushroom and what's a toadstool? 
for some people still, it used to be many Americans, we look through at mushrooms through that fear. And all mushrooms are considered toadstools. And toadstool, it's a British term kind of referring to a mushroom that's likely poisonous or not edible. And this classic little toadstool amanita, um, I can convince the toad to sit beside it for me to photograph this. Um, he says, definitely, it's a toadstool. And that's the question. When you look at their, look at those mushrooms, are you seeing the wonder, the beauty, the potential edibility, or are you seeing they're all toadstools? And this is some original artwork by a, an artist named Beatrix Cromwell. And you can buy there, she has two versions of these, these toads um, that are available on Etsy. So look her up and, and, and I just borrowed her image for this. But almost anything can be a toadstool if you bring that fear to bear that emotional reaction that says, ooh, I don't like this idea of mushrooms. I was interviewing someone for a, an internship in, in our agency. And at the very end, I said, so what do you think about mushrooms? And to my mind, it was a question to find out if you Googled me or not. And he hadn't. He said, I, I, I don't much like mushrooms. Uh, and that is what many people grow up with. We have been a culture that is mycophobic, mushroom fearing, even though, you know, in Maine, most of us come from roots that go back into Central Europe or some part of Europe or Eastern Europe, um, where many peoples have used mushrooms seasonally as a part of their diet every year, particularly where there are forests. And yet in this melting pot of America, People learn to fear them. So what messages did you grow up with? Don't touch that mushroom, it's poisonous. Go wash your hands. That idea that all mushrooms are toxic and if they're toxic, they will kill you. That assumption of danger. And yet in many cultures, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, highlands of Mexico, China, Japan, you know, so many areas, they're is an embracing of mushrooms. They grow up learning mushrooms from their parents and uncles and grandparents. And they, they learn the, the names of the mushrooms with their ABCs. Um, and there's that assumption of goodness. So a couple of Russian quotes here, one from um, Pishvin, the fallen leaves are already smelling like spice cakes. And the white mushrooms, which are um, Boletus edulis, are uncommon. But if you find them, you pounce on them like a black kite. Cut them off and remember that you promised yourself not to cut them off right away when you saw them, but to admire them first. Again, I promised myself and forgot. And I can relate to that feeling. When you find it, it's that, oh, they call it the quiet hunt. You want to grab it. And another, Valentina Pavlona Wasson was a pediatrician raised in, 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 in uh, the Ukraine and moved to here. And she said, when we were naughty, our mother would punish us by forbidding us to go mushrooming. So if anybody here, did you grow up with that kind of messaging? Oh, no, 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 you can't go mushrooming, you've been bad. Not me. I grew up in a divided household. An Irish father, no mushrooms would grace our table, and a German-French mother who actually later admitted to collecting mushrooms on the ranch in Montana when she was a child. So what did you grow up with and what did you learn? And how are we changing that as a culture? So for a long time, we have lived with the idea that unless you're an absolute expert, I love that, Megan, unless you're an expert, you should not be collecting mushrooms for food because it takes an expert to be able to determine which are the edible ones and which are the toxic ones. And as an expert, I will be the first one to tell you that within some groups of mushrooms, that is true. Like the boletes, this is a group of red and white, bo uh, excuse me, bullies, ruchulas. This is a gr group of red and white rushula mushrooms. And there's probably six or seven different species in these photographs. Some of them are edible. 
Some of them are very hot and fiery and peppery and would make you sick to your stomach. And even with a microscope, they're a difficult group to determine species apart. So in this group, in some others, that's true. And tonight, I want to talk about the idea of a foolproof group of mushrooms that you can start, start to collect and use for food. So really, really, it's a concept. And the idea of the foolproof came from uh, this man named Clyde Christensen. And he was a mycologist in the central part of the country, starting you know, back in the late 1930s, all the way up into the mid 60s. And in 1943, he wrote a book called Common Edible Mushrooms. And in it, he had a little chapter that he devoted to the foolproof four. And you know, he said, these mushrooms, they're common, they're easy to identify, and they don't have any mushrooms that look like them that are toxic. And they've got a long established history of being eaten as food. And he said, you know, I want to invite people to begin to collect those mushrooms and to in integrate them into their diet. This is in the early 1940s, as the industrialization of food was really starting to get momentum in this country. He was pushing against that. And for Clyde Christensen, his foolproof four were these. All morels, anything under the genus Morchella. The sulfur shelf, um, we often call it now chicken of the woods, um, Lady Aporus sulfurius. The puffballs, and he said any puffball, all puffballs, if you cut them open and they're pure white on the inside and the flesh is firm, they're edible. And the shaggy mane. Caprinus camatus. And we're going to talk about each of these in more detail tonight. And for me, the morels and the sulfur shelf, they're maybe kind of foolproof, but I want to talk about the, the caveats, the warnings about them. And as we dive into the mushrooms, I have a caveat for you. This is a presentation to bring awareness to and bring excitement to you. This should not be the information that you use to collect and eat mushrooms. We're going to talk about resources at the end more, but just that kind of caveat. So let's talk about a foolproof group of mushrooms. And rather than, you know, when I started thinking about developing a foolproof group of mushrooms for this region, and I said foolproof four, I said, nah, no, I don't think so. Is it, you know, the sumptuous seven? Is it the nifty nine? And what I came down to really was that for every one of us, think about where you go mushrooming, what type of habitat, where is your kind of backyard, and develop a group of foolproof mushrooms that you can start with. So I think of it as a foolproof few. And these would, again, these would be mushrooms that in your area would be relatively common. You can find them, you know, certain times a year pretty predictably. They're distinctive. They're, you can easily identify them. They don't have any common toxic lookalikes and that they're really yummy. So that's what's guiding this. And so I'm going to show and we're going to go through a list of foolproof mushrooms I consider foolproof. And then I'm going to add, we're going to bring in, a, you know, some others that maybe could be, should be, maybe not be um, on that list toward the end. So someone asked, really puffballs that large? And we'll talk about those in a minute. Yes, very large. As large as 30, 36 inches sometimes. Those are, those are usually too big to eat, though. So this is the group that we're going to talk about. I'm not going to go through the list. We can just admire the Neohelix albularis, the white-lipped snail that uh, I've, I love photographing. Um, it's mostly nocturnal, but you can find it on wet days in the woods. So let's dive in. And I'm going to talk about them briefly and talk a little bit about how to use them in edibility. Um, we're going to start with the golden chanterelle. And we're going to start with it because based on a couple of different surveys I've done about 15 years apart, this is the most commonly collected and appreciated edible wild mushroom in Maine, certainly and likely in the Northeast. And 
it, there's a good reason. It's common. It's common across a number of different forests, trees, you know, it grows mycorrhizally in symbiosis with them, but you can find them with other, with different trees. So it's common. It's pretty easily recognized. And I'll bring in one warning around that in a minute. And it's, you know, when you find it, you may find there's a number of people on this program who say, well, you know, I have my favorite mushroom patch, the place where I find it every year when it rains. And that's not uncommon. They're loyal. What that means is so long as the forest is not disturbed, if there's adequate rainfall, those chanterelles are going to come back. And in a really wet year, you're going to find them where you don't typically see them, but they'll, they'll be even more common. So they're easy to recognize because of that bright golden color, um, and they're yummy. They're really a gentle flavor. And I put in here, they're fat soluble because so you need to add, you know, butter. And if you're totally vegan, some form of neutral oil to cook them because the, the flavors get, get released into that, into that fat. So I put this down as Cantharellus siberius. That's the formal name, which is actually a European name. And there are, there's a huge transition in the taxonomy of this group of mushrooms. So here, the, the common ones are probably Cantharellus elenensis, Cantharellus phasmatis. There's a few others, but don't worry about them. They're all golden chanterelles. They're all really yummy. And if you find them in the woods, you're going to often find a patch of them. And there will be almost always, unless it's a very early in the season, all stages. From the really young button you see here on the left-hand side to the, um, to the only mature one that's even open fully and fluted on the edges, that's really typical as they troop across an area. So in this next picture, the, the same thing. The one on that top right has probably been around for about a month, maybe even six weeks. And yet there's some that are just emerging. And this photograph was taken in September of this year. And chanterelles, they begin to appear in the forest around, oh, I be, look for them predictably around the 4th of July or a little later sometimes a little earlier and sometimes if it's been dry you're not going to see them until the end of july so they're always going to be triggered by some rain and then they're going to be around through july and august and then into september and then it's really going to depend on the on the year sometimes they start to phase out this year um, i found them again coming back fresh ones even in october but this was a wonderful year so on this, I, I show this one here, the underside, those gill-like folds underneath, they're kind of blunted. They're not quite knife edge, and you'll notice they, most of them will fork occasionally. And that golden, golden yellow color, not orange, but yellow. And I want to I wanna contrast that with the jack-o'-lantern mushroom. Because the jack-o'-lantern, remember I said, the chanterelle grow singly or maybe in troops. The jack o' lantern grow in clusters. These dense, they're called cespitose clusters, all from one place. And they're usually, as you see in these photographs here, on the ground around the base of a tree, though they can come from buried wood. They're sap robes that grow on dead hardwood, most commonly oak in, in, in this region. And uh, that bottom right hand photograph shows the very knife edged gills. So typically, unless they're faded by the sun, these are bright orange, that jack-o'-lantern color. And the other part of the jack-o'-lantern is that they glow in the dark. If the mushroom is fresh and the gills are flesh, fresh, the gills will give off this faint green glow. It's um, bioluminescence, quite magical, quite magical. And they will sicken you. If you eat these mushrooms, you will have five to seven hours of time to worship the porcelain bowl. Nausea, vomiting, cramps, really unpleasant. So if they're orange, if they're growing in a clump, don't eat them. They're usually larger. So these are both together. 
the right hand side and the bottom left are chanterelles, that golden yellow, blunted gills, and the, the cluster of the orange ones are the jack o' lantern. So they can be similar size. Often the jack o' lantern is larger, um, but, but not always. Make sure you know them both so you can avoid the jack o' lantern. Every year, I work with the poison centers and uh, I deal with one, two, three, four cases of people sickened eating this mushroom. Absolutely needless. So the second most popular, and for some people, it's their top mushroom. Second most popular in the surveys I've done is the black trumpet. Cantharellus phallus, Cantharellus cornucopioides is the, is the European name. And it is, it is a thin fleshed open tube uh, that is gorgeous. And they can range from this kind of grayish pink because the spore color is aqua pink to a very dark, dark brown, almost black. And they are wonderful. They grow in the same period of time. I found them as early as the end of June. I've also collected them into mid-November. So they can full range of, of season and they're very strongly dependent on a good abundant rainfall. In a dry year, you find very few or none of them. In a year like this past 2021, probably one of the most abundant black trumpet years I've seen in many, many, many years, if not ever. They were everywhere. Don't count on the same abundance next year. So these are mycorrhizal. They grow symbiotically with oak and beech and oak and beech hemlock together. If you find a forest with that mix, you know, it's a good, good area. Um, and they will not come until there is a good soaking couple of rains. And again, like the chanterelles, that mycorrhizal, the mycelium will be in that forest and just waiting for another abundant rainfall. So you keep going back to those places again. It's a choice, choice edible. As someone, yeah, several people in the chat said, hey, my favorite, my favorite. Yeah. Um, Cindy says, poor, poor man's truffle because of that rich flavor. The French also call this the trumpet of death, trompe de mort. And I used to say, oh, they do that because they don't want people who haven't eaten them to collect and eat them. Reality, in, you know, in the French countryside, a funeral procession would be preceded by someone blowing a black horn, a black trumpet. And that's where the, the name comes from. If they're growing in um, a mossy area, they show up very easily. They hide very easily in, in leaf litter. And a cluster like this is very common, a common growth form. <clears throat> um, cooking these, you know, these are incredibly abundant. And I'm hoping that Michael Solomon is, is, is on, on the call today. Um, I, he, uh, he had a Facebook post of some of one of his infused sourdoughs that had, um, I can't remember what that one was infused with. I believe it was an herb infused. And he said, what are ideas? What are ideas that people would infuse with? I said, why don't you do one with black trumpets and shallots and Parmesan cheese? And he said, oh, wonderful. Do you have any black trumpets? So I shared the black trumpets. He made the bread. Oh, my God. Wonderful. But this is a mushroom that lends itself to all kinds of flavors and tastes simply sauteed and mixed with scrambled eggs, maybe a little cheese, phenomenal. It's great on pizzas and focaccias. It makes an incredible risotto into gravies and stews. It's just diverse uh, and versatile. Um, and if you dry it, you can use it forever. So anytime I have an abundant year like last year, I dried as much of it as I could get a hold of. And then I use it until I have another abundant year. Oh, so Michael, his salmon is entering the waiting room now. So he would have missed this. Let him in if you can. We might have to go back and show him that one. You'll have to tell him in the chat. So the next mushroom I want to talk about is variously called the hedgehog, which is a commoner, common name now, or sweet tooth mushroom, which is what I grew up with. Um, this is hiddenum repandum. 
and very distinctive because underneath that cap, rather than gills or pores, you have little tiny stalactite teeth. And someone asked, how do you dry black trumpets? I always use, particularly in this part of the world, I, not in New Mexico where I grew up, I use a pressure, I mean, a heat controlled, hot, uh, hot air dehydrator. You want them to dry rapidly so they don't mold. Yeah. We'll talk about, Megan, bring that question up at the end, the over harvesting, okay? We'll talk about that broadly. So the, the sweet tooth is another mycorrhizal mushroom, likes, um, I find it often with hemlocks, but other with other trees as well, oaks. Um, it's very distinctive. Often it's that kind of peachy, um, pale color. It can be really common in the late summer and into fall. Some years, not so common. And so the close-up of this underside shows these little tiny teeth. So that's where the spores are made. So very distinctive. Um, and in the fall, there's a smaller one that has, it's called hidden umbilicatum because it has that tiny little um, belly button in the center, that depression. And I find these usually September into October um, with hemlocks. They're smaller, up to about two inches. Um, and on the very edge of this photograph, you'll see just the edge of, a, of another mushroom. That was a Matsutake. So it's not unusual for them to grow in the same type of forest and habitat. A lovely flavor. I love the sweet tooth because when you cook them, they keep a little kind of a crunchy texture and a lovely flavor. They're also nice mixed with chanterelles. They complement each other very nicely. So moving on, we're moving from mycorrhizal to saprobic, the rotters. And we're moving from the forest into the tree or the edge of the forest, the pastures, the, the farmyard, the roadside, trail side. This is Caprinus comatus, the shaggy mane. And I look for this mushroom to grow in disturbed ground that has been where someone has been building something and buried some, some organic matter. Um, um, and I find it around the time of the first frost. In cooler areas in the, in the mountains in New Mexico, I used to find this in August. But here, typically, you know, end of September is when I begin to see it. And it has this bullet shape that is very distinctive. So this is the range. Caprinus is the genus of the inky caps. So as it grows and ages, you'll see it starts to turn black and the, and the tissue actually melts into an inky mass as it helps to release the spores. So you want to collect and use it for food before it turns black. The, the left-hand side of this group. So this is a, a mushroom that you may find growing quite prolifically where an area that has been disturbed um, and it'll grow heavily in one year. You'll see a little bit less the next year and maybe a few the following year and then none. That's a typical pattern. But where you find them growing a lot, collect them and use them. They have a really lovely, um, mild flavor. But this is a mushroom because it kind of goes through that incanization process. You want to collect it and use it ideally the same day, or at least cook it the same day. Because even if you put them in the vegetable um, portion of your refrigerator, it will still start to break down and turn black. And if you wait a couple of days and say, oh, I'm going to have those black trump or those, those um, inky caps tonight, you're going to find a mess. So use them the same day or cook them and use them later. But if you cook them, it breaks that down. Um, a lovely flavor. Um, in my second book, the one that, uh, the Chanterelle Dreams, I have a recipe for a vichy a uh, potato leek soup made with, with shaggy manes that is quite lovely. Um, they're good in creams, they're good in, in a white sauce. Many people love them just sauteed with a little salt and pepper over toast. That's just an incredible flavor. Now, there will be some people that will tell you, well, you don't want to eat those shaggy manes with any alcohol because it'll make you sick. And there are members of this genus where that's true, but it is not true of this species. So you say, nah, 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 nah. 
let's come over to my house. We'll cook some up, have a glass of wine, and I'll show you. And they'll say, no. I said, okay, I'll have the glass of wine. You watch. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of other species, one that's called the alcohol inky, which is a lovely edible. But if you consume alcohol with it or after it, um, you'll get ill for a period of time. Um, if you don't consume alcohol, it's a lovely edible. So what's the toxin? The mushroom or the alcohol? There's a question. I have found shaggy mane near some Scooby-Doo. <laughs> uh, Paul, I like that. So, um, so with any mushroom, if you find it fruiting beside a pile of dog poop, that's called a contamination. That's called just good hygiene. Don't do it. Yeah. So back into the forest or the often often the forest edge. We're going to talk about the hen of the woods. And this is usually in the top three or four edible species in this region. And this is a mushroom that you find, I find anywhere from the very, very end of August, if it's a cool year, up through October until the first hard, hard frost. And it's just um, it's growing on the ground. I'll show you a picture in a minute at the base of a tree, occasionally from buried wood. Um, and it's the mycelium is rotting the hardwood and the, um, the major interior wood of the roots. So it, it rots the tree, but, and it fruits on the ground around the tree. And if you find one of these, even if you find it, it's too old to use, remember where that tree is. I have a tree outside of Camden, Maine, where I found this fruiting first in 1983. And that tree still produces some edible mushrooms occasionally. Not prolifically, but occasionally. So it's an excellent edible. We'll talk about this as a medicinal mushroom next week. But, you know, it's firm. You want to collect it when before there's any sign of yellowing on the pores underneath, when it's firm and, and, and fresh. This is a young one that's about six, five inches in diameter, really too young to be ideal. It would still be great edible, but let it grow because it grows. The average size clump is probably six to eight inches, and I have found them more than two feet in diameter. The first one of these I find every year, I collect it and I chop it up or I pull it apart and I saute it with some olive oil and some garlic, maybe a little tamari, and I have it very simply over rice just as a, as a, as a great meal. But it's really, really versatile. The, the firm flesh can be used in so many ways. So this year, after we had several dry years, Mayataki, the head of the woods was fruiting all over the place. So this tree is, uh, is, a, is a forest where I've found it before. And you'll see this one tree, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight clumps that you can see around the base of this oak tree. And if you have good eyes and you look at the tree beyond it, there's several clumps around that too. That day I walked down there and it's about a mile and a half in from any kind of path or woods or, or road, and I could probably have collected 100, 150 pounds of it. I brought one little clump home because that's all I would be able to have used. I had plenty. And that's etiquette means don't collect more than you're going to use. Leave them out there. And we'll talk more about that later. So this is a wonderful edible. Um, it's really versatile. You can chop it up and saute it and freeze it, perceive it. You can dry it, but if you dry it, rehydrating it, it keeps a very tough leathery consistency. So if I dry it, I put it in a food processor and, and powder it and use that powder um, to flavor and add protein and medicinal components to dishes. Cindy says she traded trumpets and hedgehogs for Maya talking. Not bad, not bad. I'm not sure which we were trading for which, but either way, there was a winners on that side. So the next mushrooms, and I'm calling mushrooms are the oysters, because in Maine, we have three common species. And they all grow on hardwood. In the spring, we have them fruit, spring to early summer, they're fruiting on aspens. 
and it's called the Aspen oyster, Pleurotus populinus. In the midsummer, they're fruiting on maple and beech, and it's the summer oyster called Pleurotus populinus. And in the no, pulmonarius, Pleurotus pulmonarius. And in the late fall, mid to late fall, you have this one, the typical, and we used to lump these all together as to Pleurotus austriatus. So I call it the fall oyster. And this tree that you're seeing in this photograph was outside of hope. And I drove by it, I saw this tree, and there was probably 30, 40 pounds of oysters on there, just perfect, perfect condition. And I knocked on the door. Guy answers. I said, Hey, I introduced myself. I said, You know, I'm a bit of a mushroom nut. And I'm wondering, can I photograph the oyster mushrooms on that tree? And I would love the opportunity to take some home for food as well. And he looked at me a little bit like I was strange, which is not unusual when people are looking at me. And he said, You know, sure, I guess so. And he thought about it for about five seconds. He says, But save some for me. I said, No problem. Um, so this is a mushroom that is really aggressive as a rotter, a saprobe on, on wood. Um, it'll, it'll live. So this tree had that 30 pounds of oyster mushrooms fruiting this year. The following year, it probably had a, a pretty good crop. The year after that, it had probably exhausted what it could grow on, and it was done. So aggressive, it's easy to cultivate at home. It has a nice firm texture when you, and this is the perfect stage to collect it in when it's still a little rolled over. You need to, to kind of cook it long and lean because it's a little tough and it may be hard to digest if you undercook it, um, but it, it's really lovely. Nice flavor, it's a good edible and we'll talk about its medicinal components next week. Um, so, and the, the one in the midsummer, Pleurotus pulmonarius, I think it's got the best flavor of the three, but they're all pretty similar. Again, a lot of that around this year. Paul says, how about stuffing with them North Haven oysters, spinach and bacon, be pretty good. Maine oyster Rockefeller, I like that, yeah. Um, so I, have, I know people who even cultivate this on a roll of toilet paper which is not something I would typically do, but it's possible because it, it grows so easily. So moving on, another phenomenal edible, which we're gonna talk about its medicinal qualities next week, are the group that we call lion's mane or comb tooth or bear's head tooth or bear's head hidden them. Or, there's a bunch of common names and there's three species across the Northeast, two in Maine, one further south, uh, Arenaceous. And Arenaceous is also easily cultivated and available in cultivated form. And they all share the same characteristics. They are an ice fall of teeth. So here's two species in these photographs. And, um, and it's common fruiting on wood, never on the ground. It might be on a log that's dead and lying on the ground or a, a standing dead wood or the damaged heartwood of even a living tree for a period of time. So very easily identified um, and it's, it's rotting that tree so it'll grow for a few years. It loves beech wood. It really likes birch wood, and you'll see it occasionally on maple. I've seen it rarely on, on oak, but beech and birch are it's really its and, and maple are its favorite, favorite habitats. And it's gorgeous. You want to get it when it's pure white. If it starts to turn a little pinkish or brownish, it's getting old. Um, and it's an excellent edible, nice flavor. Many strict vegetarians will love this because of its, uh, it reminds them of seafood. Um, Jolene, I find on birch, oftentimes it's even larger, so it's easy to see. Um, so you'll see this, this one that's very, very widely branched. I love the flavor a bit uh, more than, than the, the, this larger comb tooth but they're both really good. And we'll talk about its medicinal components next week. So choose it when they're young and firm. It's got a lovely, makes a lovely soup or a pasta dish in aioli or white sauces. It's just lovely. <clears throat> this year, there was a lot around. Go back to the same places, keep looking next year. So this is one of the species that to me is eh, 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 
in terms of whether it's a foolproof mushroom here. Partially because across most of Maine, it's not common. This is the morels. And across the country, this is the most commonly collected and eaten wild mushroom in the entire country. And there are, there are festivals in the Midwest. They, they just go crazy over it. And they should. It's a wonderful, lovely edible. But here in Maine, though I find them every year, every year across the region, um, it's taken a long time for me to be pre, you know, consistent and be able to, to find them. Old apple orchards, there's some, and I'll show you a photograph from an apple orchard here, uh, or, or a good home for it. Um, around dying or recently dead elm trees for a couple of years. And I find them in rich ash forest with ash and basswood. They tend to like disturbed ground. So I've, I get emails from people every year or so that say, well, you know, we cut a bunch of wood and uh, you know, I found them coming up where we cut that wood last year. So they like disturbance. They also come after forest fires. And they like sweeter soil. So um, that soil where there has been a fire is, is short-term sweet. And there's some other combinations that cause it there. And areas where there is limestone. I live in, in, the, in Rockland and we have some limestone in parts of the, the area around here. So that's one of the places I hunt. So caveats, if you do not cook this mushroom, you will get sick. There was a famous case of a big banquet to celebrate a, a, a mycologist who was retiring. And the chef put this together, the salad where he sprinkled chopped morels across it, not cooked, raw ones. And there were a number of people who got quite ill. So you want to cook them. Um, and if you're collecting an apple orchards, if it's an old commercial orchard where they used um, lead arsenic, arsenate as a, uh, um, as a pesticide or fungicide, um, be cautious because that is, stays in the soil. So this is a photograph that shows that they come up commonly, the yellow morels at least, about the same time apples are blooming and lilacs are blooming. This is a photograph I took in an apple orchard. Um, these are a little young, um, but still lovely. And this shows you the range of kind of sizes of mature ones. These are two different populations. The top ones growing with elm trees, the bottom ones growing with apple trees. And so the idea is, if you can, wait until they're mature before you collect them. And that means, are they off a path where only you can find them? Because I find them, you know, young, tiny, tiny, half an inch, inch tall in a place where I know they grow every year. And I wait and I wait and I wait and I wait 10 days, sometimes two weeks until they're four or five inches. And then I collect them because the flavor is so much richer when they're mature. You want to make sure you, I always slice them in half because little sow bugs and things will dig a hole in them and then invade and, and hang out in the inside. So you wanna evict the borders. Some people will soak them in salt water to do that. They really love a longer, slower cooking time to let the flavors develop. And they're a really robust flavor that can be used in so many ways. This is another one. If you're lucky enough or fortunate enough to find a bunch of them, dehydrate them and save them for the winter. Yeah. Um, one caveat again with this, we have more commonly in the state of Maine, the false morel, the ones on the left-hand side here than the true morel. So these three photographs were taken on the same day in the same property. Um, and the golden false morel there, which is gyromitra corfii or um, montagna is edible though I rarely find it in Maine. Um, and the true false morel is a toxic species, particularly if it's eaten raw. It, it, you know, there have been people not in, in the United States in any time recently that have died eating this mushroom. So I, you know, and the toxin in it is highly, highly carcinogenic. Uh, I, I don't mess with that at all. Stick with the true morels. 
so puffballs, I'm going to move through them really quickly. They're common. There's a number of forms, tiny, tiny, small ones, very, very large ones. They're usually in the open areas, you know, fields and edges, except for the, the ones that small ones that grow often in the forest on wood. Um, and I want to talk about the purple spored puffball. They like, they're in some years, they're very common, particularly late summer and fall when we start to get those heavy downpours. Um, if you cut them open and they're pure white on the inside, there it's a good edible, lovely flavor, well worth using. As they age in these ones in the middle, you can start to see it turning a little bit yellowish. It's going to be bitter by then. These ones turn deep purple on the inside as they mature. Another one that's even larger is the giant puffball. And this is the same forager. The photographs were taken 10 years apart, my son Dash. And this from the same field. And they so if you find where they grow, they'll grow there on and on. In fact, I talked to a woman who collected off this field 35 years ago regularly. And they can get easily two feet in diameter and be firm. Uh, my, my older son there is, is holding one that's quite firm at about 10, 12 inches in diameter. And you want to get them firm and pure white on the inside. So in this photograph, this is the same mushroom. So cut open, pure white, firm, no coloration. Um, it's a lot of food and a really nice flavor. The smaller ones, a couple species of lycoperdon that grow in the forest, uh, the gem studded puffball, the pear shaped puffball. In the woods in the fall, late summer, fall, the pear shaped puffball can be quite numerous growing on dead wood. And again, if you cut them open, and I would urge you to cut these open, each one before you cook them, if they start to turn yellow, they get bitter. Cut them open, they're pure white, it's a nice edible mushroom. Many new mushroomers start with the puffballs. Here's one that's mature that shows the puff of spores when, it, when, it's, when it's mature. Now, one caveat in this group, if you find a firm, puffball that's just quite hard and you cut it open and it's black or dark gray on the inside. This is a genus of puffballs called scleroderma, tough skin. And it's got that thick rind around it and that dark interior. These ones cause gastrointestinal problems. Don't eat them. There's three or four or five species of these in Maine most years. So those are my foolproof ones. There's a bunch that I could have put in here, but there's some, they're more problematic. They're not as easy. They're not as common. There's some more lookalike problems. These are, these are kind of that second level of edibility. And there's some that I'm, you know, people are already saying, well, why didn't you include this? Why didn't you do that? And yet I want to acknowledge, you know, most people would say the chicken of the woods a chicken mushroom or sulfur shelf should be a foolproof. I say be cautious with it. They're common, they're distinctive, distinctive. Um, and the caveat is for some people, some people, this mushroom is just doesn't agree with them. Never could. And this is a mushroom, if you don't cook it well, it will sicken you. So Cook it completely, be cautious around it. Um, it's best when it's young and tender. I see too many people collecting and using this when it's tough and woody and fibrous, and that's not good. What I wanna throw in as an honorable mention is the field mushroom or the meadow mushroom as I learned it, the agaricus, the, the wild equivalent to the supermarket button mushroom. And they call them pink bottoms sometimes because this is a mushroom that grows in the fields or edges. Um, and it starts out, the gills are quite pink. And as it matures, it goes from pink to tan to brown to dark, bittersweet chocolate brown, that, that sequence of events. And this, this species tends to be under four inches in diameter. This is a group of mushrooms that are, you know, there was a, recently a book put out that's about three inches in diameter uh, on this genus. It's, uh, so we're really understanding them better. There's several related species. There's some large ones called horse mushrooms, also edible, but take your time and learn them. So I wanna finish with some guidelines. 
some guidelines on where you're thinking about collecting mushrooms for that new mushroomer before you ever start collecting mushrooms. I urge you to make sure that you have a good way of learning them. And I want you to spend as much time learning the edible ones as you do the common toxic ones of your region. So use field guides, we'll talk about those. Join a class, a walk, we'll talk about those. Join a mushroom club or my mycological organization like the Maine Mycological Association. Find a mentor, ideally. And by a mentor, by a mentor, I'm talking about someone who has a good basis of knowledge, whose judgment you trust, and then you do befriend them. Do anything you can to make them smile when they see you coming. Now, when you first start collecting mushrooms, be slow. Start slow, stay safe. This should never, ever be considered that sport where you I'm gathering the most, the longest list of mushrooms that I've eaten. Because if you go with that attitude, you're going to get sick. Start slow. I've been sickened one time, 1986. And I, I can tell that story another day. But so be careful. If you're collecting mushrooms, don't collect them from that yard that has lots of pesticides, never from golf courses, never from heavily, heavily traveled roads. Use uncontaminated ground. And for food, collect them when they're young and firm and prime, not old because old mushrooms start to break down and mold. And for identification, get all ages and stages, because sometimes that's really helpful and needed. And do anything you need to do to understand the habitat, do a spore print to understand the spore color so you get the information you need. And never consider eating a mushroom until you're sure of it, 100%. When in doubt, as they say, throw it out. I've done that many, many times when I was not sure. So the last thing, when you're starting to eat mushrooms, always cook mushrooms. Mushrooms are never to be considered part of a raw food diet. There's some mushrooms, little bits will do fine, but know yourself, be cautious. If you're eating a new mushroom, you only eat one species. Don't mix them together. And don't, um, I typically, if it's, if it's something that is not absolutely foolproof, I never share it. I'm the first, only one to eat that the first time. And I eat a little bit. Take photographs so that if you call Poison Center, they, they have things to send me. And be cautious sharing it with people with vulnerable health. Some people have trouble digesting mushrooms. And if their health is already challenged, don't push it. When I'm serving mushrooms to somebody else, I always let them know, this is a wild mushroom that I collected, this is what it is, this is where I find it. And if they're at all anxious or you know, nervous about it, I'll say, oh, feel free not to eat it. That's okay. More for me. That's okay. And really, the bottom line of this is have fun with them. So I would love it if people right now Put in the, the book that you find most helpful or the, the resource you find most helpful for identifying mushrooms. Not a ton of books, but put down your favorite because you want to find out, you want to find a book. And if you're only interested in, you know, 10 or 20 edibles, you get a book that focuses on those. If you're really interested in learning the wonder of mushrooms, get a, a deeper field guide. Learn about internet sites. Type in if you use an internet site or a Facebook page, type in the ones you, you find really valuable. The internet, the ones I use a lot, there's one called MycoExpert, excuse me, mushroomexpert.com, uh, Michael Quo's site that is really good. There's one, I, if, you, if you read French, Michael Quebec, which is out of Quebec City, um, is wonderful, wonderful, but it's in French. Um, there's some others out there. For Facebook, there's a whole lot that are going out there. Um, Facebook, people get more enthusiastic. Don't go with your first response. Um, you know, there's some really good people that monitor those, but sometimes there's some bad information there that comes up. Be cautious.
Join the Maine Mycological Association. Costs all of about 12 bucks a year. You get to hang out with other mushroom nuts that are a little nerdy and learn about mushrooms. We do winter lectures as well. Find a mentor um, and really practice patience. You know, find my book. Sometimes people say it may be currently out of print. I hadn't heard that for sure, but um, you know, it's a wonderful romp through the, the land of mushrooms. We'll talk about my medicinal mushroom book next week. And recognize that I do a lot of classes, day long workshops on identification. Every year, um, my friend Michaeline and I teach up at Eagle Hill, a five day intensive seminar we call Mushroom Camp. That's just a load of fun. Um, and I'm going to be doing an, uh, an, an advanced kind of pop up bolete workshop this year. Um, and I don't know when it is because it has to be coincided with the, the rainfall and maybe a foraging and cooking class. There's some other things I'll be doing. Um, and, you know, I'm going to open it up at this point for questions. I'm going to finish with Rumi. So let the beauty you love be what you do. There are a thousand ways to kneel and kiss the earth. And with John Muir, and I love this, he says, because this is what I do. And into the forest I go to lose my mind and find my soul. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and at some point, I'm going to, really, I hadn't done this before. Um, Melanie, are you going to, do you have, you, do you have people's emails when they registered? Yes. I'm going to send you a resource that you can email out to them, which is just the common, um, uh, common kind of foolproof edible mushrooms, just as a resource guide. That would be wonderful. Thanks. Um, should did you want to unmute to have people ask questions, or did you want have people to put them in there in the chat? There's a couple to follow up on that I was grabbing as we went along. All right. So once you ask those, I'm going to go ahead and have people un unmute if you'd like. You feel free to put it in the chat. Um, and is it um, is it possible to show everybody? Yes, I believe so. Um, we just need show? to change to the gallery view. Yeah. And unspotlight you. Yeah, there we go. So people can see each other because I don't need to be spotlighted anymore. I'm tired of that. <laughs> um, so there were a couple to follow up on from Megan. Um, can you over harvest an area? Yeah, that's a good one. And, and to my mind, my attitude is I'm always going to get the young and the, the, the fresh ones. I don't want to get the, I don't want to get the really young ones. I don't want to get the really old ones. And I'm always going to be conscious of how much is growing in the woods. I'm never going to get more than I can use. And I'm always going to leave a lot more behind than I take with me. Over harvesting uh, with, with sap robes is possible, with chaga. Um, but in general, um, over harvesting, you, if, if, think of a mushroom as an apple. If you pick all the apples off your tree, the next year it's going to have a new crop of apples. And mushrooms are the same way. But think of it as, as the dynamics of how many different organisms use those mushrooms for food. So be gentle with the resource. Don't be glutton. Yeah. Other questions? There was another question, I think, from Eben. Would you encourage? them to grow by burying biomatter? Um, know the species you're trying to encourage and what it needs to grow. So if you're trying to encourage chanterelles, they grow mycorrhizally with the trees that are there. Make sure the trees are healthy. And there are some really kind of low tech ways of, of trans them. If, if you plant like first seedlings where, where the chanterelles are growing, the, those, the, the, the mycelium will um, move, transfer onto those, the fur as well, and then you can transplant those later. And that's been a pretty effective way of growing them. But it's hard to plant those mycorrhizal mushrooms. Other things like the shaggy mane would be easy to do. The, uh, 
uh, wine cap stroferi, which I showed the photograph of, but not 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 as a foolproof one. That is really easy to cultivate by by putting down wood chips. I grow them in between the beds in my in, in my garden. Hi, hey, it's uh, Paul Moon is here. Uh, can you hear me, Greg? Sure, can Paul. I, I, I just want to say how blessed are we in the state to have the Fred Rogers of the <laughs> psychological field right here. His heart is as big as his passion uh, for mushrooms. I learn something every time um, I tune into one of his presentations, which isn't often enough. And and I've I've been uh, as an amateur studying this field for 34 years now. So um, I just want to thank Greg not only for his contributions in in these settings but um, the immense amount of work that he does for the Poison Control Center and other work that he's doing to help uh, our friends, neighbors, and family in the state in, in the other areas of work that he does as a professional. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank you, Paul. Actually, I am, my wife and I are gonna spend the weekend in Portland. The mushroom, uh, the Poison Control Center is putting us up and sending us out to dinner as a thank you. We've, I've been working with them for about 20 years and, and they've been meaning to do this and they're finally doing it. And, um, so make sure that that storm that's coming tomorrow passes through so we can get down there. Other questions? And I'm looking for my, my Rogers um, cardigan to wear for the rest of the presentation today, Paul. Just uh, there was a question too that uh, we will uh, because there's been so many great books and websites listed in the chat. We'll make sure that we send those along when Greg sends us the other information so that you can have the resources that were listed. Uh, you, this Paul. will also, it, like I mentioned at the beginning, it's also recorded, so we'll be putting this online on the library website. And I mean the library um, YouTube channel within the next couple of days as well. Yeah, so Jolene, I saw your comment that I'd love to see a talk on creating a mushroom garden. And I may do that. I used to do a whole lot more cultivation than I do now, because I'm really, for me, the soul food is being out in the woods. Um, so I'm less focused on that. I used to cultivate mushrooms a little bit, um, you know, we're talking 30 years ago, um, commercially, but not so much now. Yeah. So we have a qu another question. How soon after rainfall do <clears throat> chanterelle trumpets typically appear? You know, that is a, that's a really excellent question. Um, and some of that depends on the, on, on, on the, the species. It, as a general rule, as a general rule, if you get a heavy rainfall, say if you get an inch of rain or three quarters of an inch, and then you wait 10, days, you're going to see the maximum benefit from that rain. But if it's been raining consistently, it's not going to take as long. And if it's been really, really dry, it may take a couple of good soaking rains to really trigger. So it can really vary. So I hope I, I dealt with that well. Yeah. Uh, people, so... Um... For, for the future session, it's exactly four weeks from today. Uh, people were asking about that, and it is uh, it is entitled "Integrating Medicinal Mushrooms into Your Life." So just keep that in mind that four weeks from tonight, we'll be doing medicinal mushrooms. And um, I'm going to focus primarily on on wild medicinals. I'm going to I'm going to reference some of the cultivated ones. Um, some of the ones that are not here, but my, 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 my main interest is in wild mushrooms, but the broader issue of, of what are their benefits and how to integrate them into your, into your diet. Warm nights help also. Now, Katrina, warm nights help depending on the species. There's some that are not triggered until the cool nights, like the hen of the woods. You're not going to see that until the nighttime temperatures drop down into the 50s. It's not going to be triggered to fruit. So again, you got to know your quarry. If any of you are hunters, you know, with the guns and dogs and all that nonsense, you need you learn the 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 habitat, the pattern of your quarry. If you're fishing, you learn where in the stream that particular species is likely to hang out. Same way with mushrooms, learn the species. 
That's, that's to me, the life, lifetime dance with the mushrooms, to learn their stories. Great. I, I think we got most of the questions. If you have any more questions, please feel free to unmute and ask. Um, I have one quick question. Was anybody else getting really hungry during this? <laughs> I am. <laughs> I saw somebody else say that and I'm like, oh, everything looks so delicious. Um, it, uh, Cindy, it will be a different it will be a different Zoom link and we'll have the registration on our website. Um, what we can do is I'll put it down that we'll send you the registration for the next session in the email that we send out as well. And I wanna thank you, you guys have been a fun audience um, and I really appreciate all the, the, uh, the chat that was going on. That, that's always what makes these conversations more of a communal rather than just someone up here yakking. Yeah, it was a delightful presentation. Thanks so much, Greg, for this. Um, again, I'm Melanie Taylor Coombs. I'm the head of adult services at MacArthur Library. And we love to hear from people um, about programs that you'd like to see. So, um, so please reach out to me. Joe put our contact information in the chat, but all of our contact information is on Facebook and on our website as well. And we'll look forward to seeing everyone four weeks from tonight. So thanks for joining us. And thanks again, Greg. You're sure welcome, Melanie. And um, I will see you guys all out in the woods. Hopefully not in my woods. I like to do that alone. <laughs>